Good morning. Good to have you with us today. Good to, good to be together. Today we're in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, we encounter that subject, which really is on the lips of every believer, in the heart of every believer. If you're a genuine child of God, then this captures who you are. It's everything that we do really looks ahead to this time when we're going to be with God in heaven. This is, this is uh, the culmination of all that's been written in the Word of God. It's, it's the promise of God. It's, it's, the, it's the beauty of all things that He has ever promised. Um, heaven is, is viewed very differently in, in our culture and different religions. Some see heaven as, as uh, you know, a state of, state of being, a, a state of mind, uh, a place of other gods, other deities, something like that. Uh, People who, if you're going to get there, you have to have your good outweigh the bad on scales. Some view heaven as everyone's going to go to heaven. Uh, only the worst won't make it. Many, uh, some view heaven as, as not real. Uh, the scriptures, of course, uh, lay the groundwork for heaven being literal, being real, being the ultimate delight and joy of the believer of the child of God. Um, and so we see... We see the reality of heaven just, just beautifully throughout the Scripture everywhere we go. Over 500 times, over 550 times heaven is mentioned in the Scriptures. In Revelation alone, 54 times we see heaven mentioned. And so we see it throughout the Scriptures. It is the promise for the believer. And, uh, and so I want to look at the reality of that today, the promise of that today. I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you today as to what we see. So we're going to be in chapter 21 of John. And so we pick it up. Uh, we have just we're leaving the reality of of the last chapter, which was the great white throne, and so we pick it up in, in John, and the very first words in verse one are this: "And then I saw." The word "then" is from the Greek word "kai," can be translated "then." Most translations have that translation as "then." It shows a, a continuance of thought. Then I saw, and so what does what does John see here? Uh, he's not yet transformed. Um, with his new body, he's not in heaven yet, but God has given him here, and with this, uh, with this revelation of of the book of Revelation, this apocalyptic, this this promise, he is seeing an amazing reality. Uh, every sin is now behind us, as far as what John has seen in the revelation that has unfolded, and and now and now we encounter a new reality. John's trying to describe that. And John's trying to write about that. And, and, and put it into words, and of course the Lord leading him all, all that way. And so I want us to see here as we, come, as we come to this first chapter, what is it that John sees? Well, there's a number of different things. The first thing that he, that he addresses, or that's addressed here, the reality of what we see here is, is just the, is the contrast. It's, it's the greatest contrast that we see in all of human history. When we look at chapter 20, verse 11, that I saw the great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no, no place was found for them. You have a great white throne. The great white throne signifies the, the ultimate, the holiness of God. And the scene here is the wrath of God. And the holiness of God is associated with the wrath of God against unbelievers, against sin. And you have, the, you have that horrific, most horrific moment in human history, in the lives of unbelievers. Uh, there is no moment in their lives that will be worse than this because this will be the catalyst into eternal punishment and separation from God. And then, and then you have the reality of chapter 21, verse 2, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You have a, you have a holy city now that's, that's coming down. And so, and so where the great white throne was just, just prior to this and bringing an end to the history of man, the holiness of God being associated with the wrath of God against sin, now you have here in, in chapter 21, you have the holiest holiness of God, and it permeates our new home. It defines, it is, it is the quality, the characteristic of our new home that we're all going to dwell in. Holiness is not something that leads us to terror and, and alienation from and separation from God. Holiness is what now describes our, our reality under the very presence of God. Uh, that is a beautiful beautiful picture and it is it is the it is a contrast between believer and unbeliever and the reality of what we see here the second thing that we see here in in this chapter is god will make everything new that's his that's his promise look at look at verse one and then i saw i saw a new heaven 
and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Verse 5, and he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's very clear here that the Lord wants you and I to know that what we're seeing here is something that we have never seen before. Uh, what is unfolding here is something that is brand new. Um, and God is giving us now his very, very best. Um, it, says that, it says that the new Jerusalem, verse 2, is coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride. It's not the bride. It's not the church. It's not the bride of Christ, but it is adorned as a bride. It is as beautiful as the bride is itself. And so you just you just get the you just get the imagery of just of just absolute beauty of the presence of God of the of the riches of God of of the of the awe and wonder and majesty of what this city is like uh, the the beauty in which He has created and and John is going to try to describe what he sees here and we fail to really catch the full understanding of what this is because we are we are so unable to until we see it until we're there first corinthians reminds us that this is this is going to be new it's going to be beyond our wildest imaginations as it is written what no eye has seen no ear heard nor the heart of man imagine what god has prepared for those who love him god has prepared something for us that's simply beyond imagination now the context of this verse here is what is what is uh knew what we haven't seen and what is far beyond comprehension is ultimately in this context it's the it's god in the flesh it's jesus christ coming in the flesh it's him coming to earth it's the incarnation of christ it's the mystery of the gospel the mystery of god's grace and love to us through salvation that's the context here but it's also true of the reality for the for you and i when we think of heaven and what that's going to be like because that reality will also be this experience here uh, it is absolutely beyond description. It, it just boggles the mind. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. This is an inheritance that is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. It is kept in heaven for you. And everything that heaven will be, it, it'll, it'll, it'll never uh, pass away uh, It'll never break up. It'll never be broken. Uh, it'll never be corrupted. It'll never lose its 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 luster. It is unfading. Everything about heaven will satisfy. Will be the joy of our existence for all eternity. Why? Because God is there. Because Christ is there. Because of what He's created here. Uh, heaven is um, it's a reality. It's not it's not just the things. It's not just the, the city that we're going to see and the details of the city. It's that we're with God. We're going to see that. It is heaven itself. God is giving us his very best. I go to prepare a place for you. Ultimately, this is the place that he is preparing for us. Um, there, will not be a, there will not be a Christian who has ever lived that when we get to heaven, we will be disappointed in anything about heaven or eternity. There will not be one moment of disappointment. There will be not one moment of regret. There will be not one moment of disillusionment. Not one. Heaven will satisfy you and, and me and the believer for all eternity. Our current earth that we live on is finite. Of old, God, you laid the earth, the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. That's where the, earth, the old heaven and earth are burned up. You will change them like a robe. They will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. The old heaven and earth will pass away. God is bringing us a new heaven and earth. God will always be, and what he will give us in the new heaven and earth will always exist, because God always exists. Our reality will be infinitely 180 degrees different from what we know now. The earth that we live on now, the existence that we have now, even, even the beauty of what we see around us, because God has given us beauty. God has given us the, the ability to, to see the, the awe 
and the wonder of his creation, uh, the, the variety of his creation, the, just the beauty in all that we see. But we're told in Isaiah 65, I create a new heaven and earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. This life here will be forgotten. This earth here will be forgotten because heaven will overwhelm us with the presence of God, with the beauty of God, with the beauty of what it is, with the purity and the holiness and the righteousness. Everything will be right for all eternity in our new reality with Christ. Second Peter reminds us that, you know, we are waiting. We're waiting for the best. You know, often when you hear a funeral, the, the, the idea is, I've never seen it, but you, know, you put a fork... He put a fork in the casket because the best is yet to come, right? But according to his promise, Peter says, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The best is yet to come. It's only going to get better. And it will be perfect. I want you to know that. What else does John see? What do we see here? We see, we see the contrast between unbeliever, separated for eternity, believer in the presence of God. We see everything, everything, everything made new we see the dwelling place of God. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. That's what makes heaven, heaven. We will be with the Lord. And because we are with the Lord, He will satisfy us. He's, he's, he's our satisfaction. Even right now, today, as we walk on this earth and we serve the Lord, ultimately, if you have satisfaction and inner joy, it's because the Lord is your satisfaction. He's your joy. He's your presence. And that will just be, that will just be a, a complete and total in heaven. It's His promise to us to dwell with us, we could go a lot of places. Leviticus tells us, I will make my dwelling with you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Ultimately, Israel will be a blessing to all the earth. God's promises to Israel will be fulfilled in the church. This is a promise of God's dwelling, not only to Israel, but to us ultimately. In the garden, we saw the, we saw, see the Lord walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Here, here they have hidden themselves because of sin. But prior to that sin, God uh, seemingly here ha uh, has fellowship with them, walks with them, um, talks with them. Beautiful picture from the very beginning of creation. God is there. We see God with Israel. So he brings Israel together. He gives them the tabernacle and the ability to worship Him. And the, and the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And God is there. And God goes before them and behind them. And God is their light. And God is their direction. And God is their guide. He is their shepherd. We see it in the temple when they build a permanent dwelling place for the Lord. When they settle in the land, God is there. You have the glory of the Lord that fills the house. And God has chosen Israel as his nation, and God dwells among men in the nation of Israel. And then, and then God comes in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh, and, and, and it tabernacles among us. That's the Word. It dwells. He dwells among us. He, he came to this earth. He, he lived among us. He knew our weakness. He understood our frailty. And he took our place on the cross. He loved us and showed us grace. And he showed us the glory of the Father. And he was full of grace and truth. God with us. A moment in time in history that's never been replicated until this time when we're in heaven with the Lord. For God to be with us in, in that kind of presence. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit. And God living in us and every believer. Every believer who by faith receives Jesus Christ as Savior. God indwelling and living in us. What a beautiful thing. So how we see here in verse 3 that now God will dwell with us forever. He will be in, around, among. Everything will permeate the very presence of God. There is nowhere that we can go where God's presence will not be with us. We will be holy before Him and we will be righteous before Him. That is, that is what heaven's all about. Because God's presence guarantees the very elimination of sin. 
the very elimination of the things that make this world so difficult, so hard, uh, so challenging, so awful. God's going to remove all of those things, and His presence will guarantee that, and His presence will, will bring a, a, a peace for all eternity. What else does John see? Well, we go to verse 4. And He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. What does He see? Everything is made right. God will make right every wrong. He will, he will right every wrong. That's what He will do here. He will make everything perfect. The scourge of sin will be over. We have this list here. It's a beautiful list. No more tears. That is the response that we have to the sorrows of life. No more death. Just simply the consequence of sin in our life. No more mourning. Just the grief. The grief of loss. The loss of loved ones. The grief of loss that sin brings because of sin in my life. And the loss that takes place there in my life because of sin. The grief that it brings. No more crying. The anguish of our soul over people, over sin, over hardship, over adversity, no more pain. Pain is the curse of sin. Everything that sin accomplishes, it brings pain. Jesus says here to John, he says to us, all these things, the scourge of sin, the presence of sin, the reality of sin, the, Im the impact of sin is, is removed for all time. Sin has no presence in our experience in eternity, in heaven, in the new heaven and earth, Sin will simply not be there. Satan, his demonic forces, unbelievers, simply will not be there. And we will have a we will we will have a reality that is really, folks, it's beyond comprehension. Every, every, every hardship that we face now is ultimately because, in some way, shape, or form, of sin. Not because we've sinned, but because of the impact of sin, the result of sin, the consequence of sin on this planet, upon humanity, upon us. That's going to all be removed. What a beautiful thing. It is God's promising, promise to heal, and to restore. And the scars of life will be behind us. They'll be forgotten, as we've seen earlier. The hurts of life will be behind us. We need, to, we need to keep those things before our heart every day as reminders of how good God is. How good He is. Next thing we see here is picking up in verse, verse 6. Verse 5. Let's look at verse 5. And um, we see the promise of God. Every promise of God is fulfilled. Also He said, He said, I, Behold, I make all things new. And then he said, also he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God has fulfilled his promise, the promise of God's word, the promise of every promise ever written in Scripture is now fulfilled. Everything that God has ever promised to his children, to his people, is now fulfilled in Christ. Everything. There's not one jot or tittle. There's not one letter or part of a letter that's left unfulfilled. God's Word is filled to completion. God keeps His promises. It's the most beautiful thing. Paul puts it this way. I'm sure, I'm sure of this. I'm convinced of this. That He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Right here. This is the day of Christ. The day of the Lord is ultimately that judgment, that wrath. This is the day of Christ. This is the day of blessing. This is the reality of blessing. This is, this is Jesus Christ now bringing and giving an eternal kingdom to His people. This is the reality. This is God's promise being fulfilled. In Ephesians 1, beautiful, we see this. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. God sealed you, every believer who is genuine before the Lord. He has sealed that believer with, a, with the Holy Spirit. That seal cannot be broken. Folks, a genuine believer, you and I, we cannot lose our salvation. 
We cannot be separated from God's love, from his grace, his mercy, his promises. We cannot. God holds us fast in his hand, his mighty hand. He is God Almighty. With his great love, he holds us. With his great power, he holds us. What does John see? John sees this contrast. And the, and the, the reality of that contrast is now we're with the Lord. John sees that everything now is, is made new. Uh, the old, the old has passed. The old has passed away. Uh, our experience has changed completely. We are now, we are now experiencing the very uh, presence of God that he now dwells with us and will never leave us, never forsake us. That's the ultimate promise of that the fulfillment of that promise that we see there. Everything's made right. Everything is made right. Everything now is right. Every day throughout all eternity is right. Every moment is right. Every action, every thought, every word, every motive, everything is now right. The promises of God, all of God's promises have been fulfilled. And then we come here to the end. We come to chapter, we come to verse 6. Let's pick it up in verse 6. Halfway through the verse, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. John, as he writes, he puts this down. What, what do I see? What, what do I see here? John says, I see a clear cut choice. I see a clear cut choice. We got a choice here. We have the thirsty. We have the thirsty in verse 5. The one who conquers in verse 7. Verse 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for mur murderers and the sexually immor immoral, and sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. John says, I, need, I want you to know, I want you to understand that there is a clear-cut choice here. John says, what do I see? I see a choice. I see a contrast. We have the contrast of the great white throne and the new heavenly cities. Now we have a contrast that's clear because it is the choice that is made that, re that is the result, that is the destiny of one of those two right here. John writes, To the thirsty I will give you the spring of the water of life. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for the Lord? Do you want to be with God's people? Do you desire and love to come under the teaching of God's word? Do you love to open God's word for yourself? Each day, do you, do you rely on the Lord? Do you talk to the Lord each day? Are you thirsty for the strength that he provides? Are you thirsty for the promises that he will remind you of and, and engage your life with? Are you thirsty for the character of Christ in your life? Do you long to be conformed to Christ and say, Lord, I want to be like you. Lord, I want people to see you in me. Lord, I, I want to make a difference for you. Lord, I, I, I want to uh, fulfill and accomplish your will in my life. I am thirsty for your word because your word will give me the food. Your Lord will give me the wisdom. Your word will give me the insight to be able to accomplish that. Your word will give me the ability to yield my, my will to you. I'm thirsty for that, God. I want that. John writes very clearly here, the one who, who is experiencing all that we've just written about is the one who is thirsty, the one who has come to Christ received Jesus Christ as Savior, and now follows Him faithfully and obediently in that path of faithfulness through His life, her life. So important. If you're thirsty, then you will be an overcomer. If you're not overcoming in your life, then it's because you're not thirsty. He says, he says here in verse, in verse 7, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. You know, we all still sin, but it's the patterns of life I'm talking about. It's the habits of your life that I'm talking about. It's the hunger in your life that I'm talking about. If, you, if, if God is helping you and giving you the ability to win those victories and you're seeing the habit of obedience take place in your life and you're seeing the, the habit of, of faithfulness before the Lord and, and a commitment to His church and a commitment to God's people and a commitment to give the gospel, if you're overcoming in this way and you're seeing God use you, then it shows that you are thirsty because you and I, we can't be any of those things unless first we're thirsty for the Word of God, unless first we're thirsty for the character of Christ in our life. If you're not an overcomer and if sin has its control over your life, then I would say to you, you need to get thirsty. You need to get thirsty for God's Word. You need to get thirsty for the character of Christ and the Word of God in your life because the distinction is important. If you're not ultimately thirsty in your life for Christ, if you ultimately don't desire Him, 
then there will be a distinction and Christ will make that distinction and say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because he knows your heart, not just what you're doing, but he knows why you do it and where it comes from, your heart. He says in verse 7, to the cowardly. You know, the cowardly in the context of Revelation is the one who refused to who refuses to identify with Christ. Who is afraid of identifying with Christ that they would lose their life to the Antichrist, to the false prophet, to those who hate God. The cowardly is the one who refuses to, to say, I belong to Jesus Christ. That's the cowardly. Jesus says that person will never come into heaven. The one who won't identify with me. Will you identify with Christ? Do others know that you belong to him? Do your friends know that you belong to Jesus Christ? Those who you're interested in, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever, do they know that Christ is your identity? Do they know that? Faithless. Faithless is when I'm afraid of taking that identity in Christ is because I lack faith. The second, the second word there is the faithless. I, I, I lack the faith to believe that it's worth it to follow after Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be, if I'm going to be a child of God who is winning the victory and, and ultimately who will be faithful to the end, it's because I, I have placed my faith in Christ. And I say, I do believe you. I trust you that what your word says, it is worth following through on it. It is worth obeying. It is worth investing into my life. It is worth internalizing into my life, into my soul. It is worth transforming my life. And I, God, I believe you. I will follow you. The rest of that is the result of this. Because I refuse to be identified with Christ, because I lack faith, then what I do is detestable. What I do then is, and this isn't even a complete list of sins, then what happens is sin just comes out of my life. That's what happens. Uh, I'm murdering, literally murder, uh, killing the character and reputation of others, lying about them, slandering them. Um, Sex, sexuality, immoral sexuality, it permeates our culture. That will just permeate my life if I'm not defined by Jesus Christ. Sorcery, witchcraft, um, connection to, to demonic activity, uh, to even drug addictions, all those kinds of pharmacia is the word here. There's all kinds of things. Idolaters, Christ is not first in my life. I'm first or this is first in my life. And, and lying, lying about who I am, putting up a front, putting up a mask, God knows who we are. God says, ultimately, when I come to him and I exhibit lack of faith, lack of identification, identity in Christ, I will be separated from him for all eternity. You have a choice. I have a choice. To the thirsty, to the conqueror, is this. It's, it's heaven. It's the glories of heaven. It's all the promises of God. To the one who lacks faith, to the one who refuses to place their identity in Jesus Christ and to live under that identity will not receive the promise of these blessings that we've seen here. Psalm 42. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Blessed are those, Matthew tells us, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. That's what God promises to us. That's what he wants for us. Heaven begins now. You know, there's an old song that says heaven is a place on earth, right? No, it's not. Heaven is heaven is with the Lord. Heaven is what he creates. It's not of our making. It's not. It's not a. It's not a presence of mind, a state of being. Uh, but heaven, the reality of heaven, the reality of what God's going to do, give us, will spur on the believer, the genuine child of God, and will be a catalyst and a motivation for you and I every day, because you and I will will live so that we so that we will be worthy of the name of Christ, worthy of the blessings and rewards and promise that He will give us. We live in view of the promise of heaven. It's worth it. It's worth it to endure hardship. It's worth it to sacrifice and to say no to sin. It's worth it to, to obey when it's hard. It's worth it to live for Christ among unbelievers who will hate you. It's worth it because of what Jesus Christ has promised, because of what he showed us in his example and his love for you. Do you know how much he loved you? Heaven is real because Jesus Christ loved you so much. Heaven is the gift, the greatest gift of his love. Heaven is the greatest expression of God's love to you. He loves you. And he wants you and I to love him back, to be faithful. I don't know how we can think about heaven, consider heaven, contemplate, meditate upon, put our mind on heaven and not be a changed person. How can we, how can we choose to do it our own way? How can we choose to separate from God's people? 
How can we choose to never open his word and never pray? How can we choose not to come under God's word? How can we choose not to follow in obedience and to love people who are lost because he loved us who were lost? How can we choose to do all these things if we know that God's promises are going to be fulfilled? And if we know that heaven one day will be with us, ours, if we know that one day we will dwell with him in righteousness and holiness, can a true believer say, I'm going to live my life the way I want on heaven, on this earth? The answer is no. A true believer will live for Jesus Christ. If you're a genuine child of God, if you're a teenager or a, or a young adult, or you've lived many years and you're a child of God, your passion will grow to live for Jesus Christ. Your passion will grow because of what God has promised. You and I, I want others to know, to experience this promise, this reward, this relationship. I want them to come to Christ. They won't do that unless I'm faithful to Him. A witness and a testimony for Him. Let the reality of heaven just uh, bring joy to your heart. But it's not something that is meant to communicate to us. You can live how you want, and in the end you still get the best. No, Jesus says very clearly, if I live how I want, if I say I'm a Christian, I've made a, I've made a profession of faith, and I say I'm a Christian, but I never value Christ, and I never treasure Christ, I never treasure His Word, I never treasure His work in my life, and I believe at the end of that walk and the end of that journey of life, Jesus will look at that individual and say, depart from me, I never knew you. You went to church your whole life, and you served in your church your whole life, but you never knew me. You simply didn't have a relationship. I want you to have that. I want you to know. Walk faithfully, folks. Your life depends on it. Walk, walk faithfully. It's the only proper response of a genuine believer to all that Jesus Christ has given to us. Pray that into your heart and be changed. Join with me next week. I look forward to coming back, being together again here in Revelation. Thanks again for being here today.